Hey, welcome everybody. We're back. And today we're going to be talking about MacArthur's million dollar mansion on Hollandia. Um, during wartime, um, there are always rumors uh, among the rank and file that the generals, the admirals, the leaders, um, they are living in the lap of luxury while everybody else suffers hardship. Um, part of this is distraction. Part of it, it's kind of fun to talk about these things at times. Um, part of it is true resentment of those in charge. Um, sometimes these rumors are true, sometimes they're false. And so today we've got Jim Zobel with us to kind of get to the bottom of this rumor about MacArthur living in this luxurious villa in Hollandia in 1944. Um, and right behind me is a picture of this actual place, this headquarters, just to give everybody a view before we start. Um, but Jim, why don't you set the stage for us? Um, where is Hollandia and why does MacArthur have any kind of house or headquarters there? Well, Hollandia is about uh, halfway up the coast of New Guinea on the north coast. It's where the capital of, of I think, Western Papua, Irian Jaya is what it's called now. But in 1944, it was, uh, it's probably one of the biggest moves MacArthur makes during World War II. It definitely advances the timetable on everything. In January of 44, uh, when the 32nd Regimental Combat Team went in at Sidor, uh, it made the Japanese 20th Division move out of Sayo and all these Australian uh, minesweepers go in there and they found this trunk. It had every Japanese code book in it. So overnight, um, Central Bureau, which is MacArthur's code breaking group, they've got a full disposition of every, where all the Japanese are. And so they had been planning to go to the Weewa Kansa Bay, which was about halfway between Finchhaven, which is on the Huon Peninsula, right by the Bismarck Sea, and in between uh, Hollandia. And there they had these monster airfields. They had like 40,000 troops. Japanese 18th Army under Hatazo Adachi is there. And that was where they were going to go for that end of that cartwheel operation. But then because of code breaking, they know that they can land at Hollandia where there's only about 11,000 service troops there. There's a lot of airfields there, uh, but the Japanese don't have a big contingent of infantry or anything like that there. So they wanna hit that, but they had to take the admiralties in February, they did that. Then in April 22nd of 1944, uh, they go into Hollandia, and that's where um, Kruger's 6th Army under 1st Corps, uh, Robert Eichelberger, 24th Infantry Division, 41st Infantry Division lands at these two bays, Humboldt and Tanamara Bay. They totally take the Japanese by surprise, which is a good thing because uh, these landing beaches weren't very good. The jungle to get to the Hollandia where these airfields were was really bad. It took them quite a while to get there. Uh, but once they take this place, this will become the main base for the operations to go to the Philippines. Now, in when, when they bypass Hitazo Adachi, Adachi then moved his troops through the jungle, heading towards Hollandia. He was going to take them on anyway. And they got to right at Atape, where the Jerunamore River was, and had a monster battle there. And that's where Adachi just gets uh, finally squashed. You know, he, he almost pulled this thing off. It was really crazy. But anyway, that's in July. So in August, now things are cleared up. All of that Weewok, all of Rabaul, all those bases that are you know, in the backwater now, they're all cut off so they can make Hollandia the base because Humboldt Bay is like one of the greatest bays in the Pacific. You can put like an entire invasion force of ships right there. As well, they can start building these airfields right there and get that uh, working as uh, the jump off points as you keep going across New Guinea. Because they'll go to Wakdi, Biox, Nome for, and Sansapur uh, right after that. So what they do is they decide to put Advance Echelon headquarters of Southwest Pacific area there at Hollandia. And that'll take place uh, September. All the army forces start coming up. Then you've got the 6th head Army headquarters is going to establish itself there. MacArthur creates the 8th Army under Eichelberger. They'll establish their headquarters there. 7th Fleet under Admiral Kincaid will establish their headquarters there. So now you have this monster airfield complex. You have all these headquarters there. You've got construction going on. You've got bridges. You've got culverts. You've got 135 miles of gas lines to feed, you know, aviation fuel to all that. You've got 150,000 uh, personnel there. So this becomes this monster city overnight. 
MacArthur's not going to go there, though. MacArthur's going to stay in Australia. However, uh, his chief of staff, Richard K. Sutherland, will move headquarters of Advanced Echelon, Southwest Pacific Area, to Hollandia. And he flies up and lands there on September 1st. A lot of that advanced echelon staff get there. And so by early September, you've got pretty much the, uh, the you know, the brains of, of Southwest Pacific, all these staff people, they're going to start putting together all these uh, planning operations for uh, the Philippines all together right there. And that's where that headquarters gets built. All right. So you've got a lot of admirals, you've got a lot of generals in that advanced headquarters. They all have um, kind of their headquarters, their houses in that area. Right. Tell us about the house that is linked to General MacArthur. Well, the, the what they are is, is as in, people can see right behind you, they're called engineer huts. You know, people said, yeah, these, uh, they were Quonset huts or they were these flat topped, uh, you know, army huts, but that's what those are. Those are engineer huts. And they put those two together and they put one on the backside. And what it is, is, is one side is like for MacArthur's uh, quarters. And then you also have your, your headquarters facilities in one of them, like say the one on the left side behind you. In the other side, you've got uh, uh, quarters for uh, Sutherland and four other staff people um, to live there. And then the backside one, which is on the backside, uh, as you can see, like in, in this picture right here, that is uh, the kitchen, you know, where they have the mess right there. So they put these huts together, but then it sits right on top of this engineer hill, overlooks Lake Sentani, you know, has this huge cyclops mountain behind it with this thousand foot waterfall that drops and everybody's like oh it's this you know paradise mansion that he's got and the thing is is you know none of the servicemen know that don't know that macarthur's not there you know they they start saying he's there with his family you know and everybody else and and you, you've got all these rules around because you know guys can't go swimming in the buff and anything like that because macarthur's family which is all a bunch of you know junk you know it's just a bunch of rumors is what it is but you know it's they they have this thing built right on top it overlooks everybody and anybody in that area when they look up on the hill they're like oh you know there's there's that mansion because it's painted white and you know everything else is dull you know olive drab or gray or wood or you know tents whereas this white thing is on the hill and so um yeah you start getting a, a a lot of rumors going on around it. I feel like you have uh, Admiral Kincaid, Willoughby, Eichelberger, um, Kenny, um, even MacArthur himself later on, they'll all say this was one of the most beautiful areas that they ever saw. Do you think it's that dichotomy between here you are in this very ugly war and then here you are in this place that is really Kind of beautiful in a, in a lot of ways. Do you think it's that dichotomy of this beautiful and this ugly that really encourages those rumors and gets maybe even the press involved? Yeah, Hollandia is different because um, it's it's pretty secure. Not like uh, Port Moresby was, you know, at the, right. at the beginning of the war when they're up there. Um, uh, everybody's used to just mud slop. Uh, so mm -hmm. living in tents, living under shelters, and now you've got uh dining halls you know you've got tent right. cities but they're all you know well uh you know drained all that and so everybody's just yeah finally i can you know i can relax a little bit um and it uh paul rogers who's uh sutherland's uh kind of aide and secretary he described it as a as a dry scrub brush kind of place but he said that you know looking over the lake was really nice and you could see that all the airfields down there you could see Humboldt Bay out there so it, it was in a in a, a place that had a, a million dollar view you know that that's right. for sure yeah now you, you've already mentioned some of the rumors that emerged but can you kind of give us the laundry list of what people are saying well it's like I said there's the uh, MacArthur's there. He's got his whole family there. They're living cush. They've they've got all this uh, 
million dollar furniture they've brought into there, which isn't, you know, there's, it's like rattan furniture, right. uh, you know, army cots and things like that. I mean, it's nicer than anywhere else in New Guinea, probably, but, you know, at that time, it's, 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 it's just a, a step up, you know, but it's not this, you know, I think it costs like $10,000 to ship the thing there and then prefab, you know, put it right. together. And uh, then they had, you know, this office furniture that was there at Moresby at the government house brought up and some stuff from Australia. I think they, you know, had a refrigerator that was put in there. So, I mean, they well, had, well, that's, that's, that's luxury. Yes, it is very <laughs> much so. Um, so I, you know, I, I a lot of, a lot of these rumors start to go, go around, but then, you know, like we talked about in our talk about Sutherland, um, and, you know, that, that kind of becomes the, the big rumor, you know, among okay, people. well, we'll, we'll get into that a little yeah. bit more, yeah. but um, going back to MacArthur, he, you mentioned he doesn't really spend any time there. He's not even there when the advance headquarters initially moves there. So how no. much time does he actually spend there? Well, he, he flies in there on the 11th because he goes on the Moratai operation. That's where he boards the Nashville. And in then, September? Uh, yeah, that's because the, okay. the Mor Moratai operation is September 15th. He gets there on the 11th, boards like the next day. Uh, but then comes back and stays the 17th and the 18th. So that's three nights uh, we know he's yeah. there. It wasn't a very uh, happy time that he's there. Uh, but then he comes back in October, October 11th, he's there. And then, uh, or no, October 15th. And then he boards the next day on the Nashville again to go to Leyte. And then he never comes back. So you've got a total of four nights, four nights. That, that MacArthur stays in, in that headquarters in in Hollandia. I think, you know, Jean MacArthur, when she gets brought up to the Philippines in March of 1945, she told Sidney Huff, who was like her handler, this colonel, that, you know, she want, really wanted to stop in Hollandia and see the million dollar mansion she'd been living in, because it was, it was, you know, we don't have any of the newspapers here, you know, I don't, I don't think right. those were getting collected by the staff, but there were stories, you know, about this million dollar mansion that Gene MacArthur was just, you know, really, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna foist this one on me. <laughs> <laughs> But she does stop there. You know, we don't know if she goes to see the house, but when right. she takes that trip up to the Philippines, she does, the ship does stop at Hollandia. And I think she writes a letter to her husband too, doesn't she? And say, I really hope I can stop by and see this right. million dollar house we're supposed right. to be living in in the middle yeah. of the war. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, earlier you, you said something a little mysterious. You said when he's actually there, in September, it's not a very happy time. Oh, uh, so what are, this, what are you talking about? Well, this is what we talked about with, um, you know, our, our Sutherland thing, and we always seem to get back into that. Uh, but when Sutherland comes up there, uh, early September, he's there, flies in with a few staff, and and Chief Warrant Officer Paul Rogers is there, and he said the first moment Sutherland looked out that window over Centani, over the base, over all this complex he sat there and said to himself i'm in charge now i'm running the show uh macarthur's an old man you know he can't take it and you know rogers is just like what uh boy <laughs> this is not gonna lead to anything good and then um sutherland's got his that whack officer there uh that he's brought forward um and that's what really causes all these rumors um, among all the personnel down there, that there's all these parties with whack officers up at this, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the mansion. And then even the, you know, the general officers and the admirals, they get kind of ticked off about this as well. Uh, but then what happens is, is one day uh, that Chief Warrant Officer Rogers has kind of a run in with the whack officer who is basically like, hey, do you think this wall or this wall, you know, should we put stuff up on? He's like, put it on that wall. And she says, no, we're going on that wall. And then Sutherland comes in, you know, her guy, and he says, I like that wall and picks the one Rogers did. And then uh, Rogers, an uh, hour later, is called in by Sutherland going, you will not disrespect that captain. He, you know, you will not sit there and deny her. So she had gone in there and said, you know, he's trying to assert my authority, you know, over the wall. When okay. all she did was ask his opinion. And Rogers then is like, I want out of here. I want to be transferred. I mean, he worships Dick Sutherland. You know, he thinks he's a, you know, a fair guy, right. you know, and has been with him the whole time. But he hates yeah. this woman. 
and he right the then he's just like i yeah. want out of here yes yeah. and so then uh when macarthur shows up on the 11th, he's got Roger Egerberg as doctor and Larry Larbus. Larry Larbus is like probably the biggest straight shooter you're ever going to meet. Uh, he was against all the MacArthur for president, you know, guff. He was against all this hero worship. He's like, just tell your story, man. Everybody's going to get off on that. And uh, but they get there and see this episode with Rogers and the girl was a big deal. Yeah. You know, and everybody around knows it. So as soon as Egeberg and Larba show up, people tell them the story and they go to Rogers and they're like, hey, man, you know, what happened? So he fills them in, you know, tells them everything. And then they're like, oh, boy, you know, we 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 got to tell MacArthur this because, you know, all these rumors around there that it's his place, you know, and all that. And they find all that out. And so when they're on that mission to go to Mortai, they tell him. And then when he comes back, so that's back, when he finds out. Uh, that's what, yeah, yeah. So that's when he finds out that everybody's saying he's living there. Yes, his or, wife, or, just, or you know, all a these, bunch of whack ladies. Yeah, all the all these different rumors, and he comes back. You know, he doesn't show any animosity when everybody else is around. You know, everything's great. They're working uh -huh. on because they've just gotten word they, they've got they're going to go to Leyte. So everybody's excited about that. As soon as they get back, the staff is all together, you know, and everybody's working. MacArthur doesn't show anything. But that night, uh, Dick, you know, can I talk to you alone? And then they said it just exploded, you know, over this over this issue. And and Sutherland was even like, I want to be transferred. I'm going to I'm going to resign. I'm going to take sick leave. And supposedly MacArthur was like, nope, you're going to do your job. You know, you were going into Leyte, that you're the only one that can do this. You know, this is this is your duty. And so right. that's, you know, it'll never be the same between them again. But, you know, Sutherland will, will serve him all the way through. So, you know, it's like I said before, it's a very sad affair, um, uh -huh. the way I look at it. And, uh you know, you can read about, you know, all the details in, in the Rogers book, as well as uh, Dusty Rhodes's Flying MacArthur to Victory, because they detail it pretty well about everything that went down um, there at Hollandia. But that's, you know, what it comes down to um, is, is basically this, you know, this, the situation that was going on there. That's why all these rumors get started, you know, mm -hmm. I believe, you know. Now, there are a lot of rumors about General MacArthur. I mean, we, we both are very aware of that. Um, a lot of academics and even popular historians will kind of perpetuate a lot of these rumors. Um, why do you think this one is one that most people are pretty quick to dismiss? Well, it's so not something they believe about yeah. him. So obviously ridiculous. I mean, we, we know where he was during the whole war. Uh, you know, every day, practically. And it's, it's obvious that he wasn't there for more than a couple of days. It's obvious it was just a couple of engineer huts. There's pictures of all the, you know, things. So, you know, everybody can easily say, oh, this is a right. ridiculous rumor. You know, it's, it's like he brought out gold on mattresses from Corregidor, you know, or he, he filled the B-17s to Australia with all of his personal furniture, you know, dug out Doug, you know, other things that are kind of ridiculous. Um, just get, you know, uh, half the things that they criticize him for aren't even true. Whereas we have enough stuff here to like hammer him for the next century. And people don't even look for that. So, yeah. um, you know, it's well, just. History is hard, Jim. Yes. I, it's hard. Is it really? Is it? Is it hard? It can be. Yeah. No, it's 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 a difficult thing to weave through, but I think uh, historians just see that episode as as you know just ridiculous. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Jim, for for helping us kind of get to the bottom of this one particular rumor. Um, we will be back Merry Christmas. on Monday, right at noon Eastern yes. time, and we're going to be talking about. The MacArthur's last Christmas in Manila as a family before they're forced to flee to Corregidor. Um, and so that'll be pretty interesting too. That's a very kind of touching time, very personal time for the family. And I think a lot of people don't know about that, that moment for them. So we'll be back on Monday at noon Eastern time and we will have Jim back to talk more about that. Look forward to it. All right, thank Great. you.